Good evening and welcome to our final broadcast of a live show from Tete Tete, the Opera Festival at the Cockpit Theatre on Cockpit Broadcasting. We have one more pre-recorded show from here tomorrow and some more to come later um, in the next month. But anyway, now we're really happy to be introducing Bread and Circuses, which was performed here on Sunday night. And um, yeah, it was a really fun evening. It's um, uh, There's a couple of things to say to you before we start the film. Um, and the first is the way this is an interactive broadcast is when you type questions or comments or anything you want relayed to the panel who appear after the movie into the chat, they appear on the screen in front of me and I will pass them on to the relevant people. Second thing to say is that um, this is just as we did a pilot for the DCMS for the opening of theatre. Now this whole festival is partly an exercise in reopening theatre, bringing it back to live audiences. And we're working with the Paul Hamlin Foundation to create a big report that we hope to share with our colleagues, to share our experiences of doing live work and of transmuting them to this broadcast situation so that we can help the whole of the theatre sector reopen. And to that end, you'll be sent an email with a questionnaire in it after this live broadcast, and we'd really appreciate it if you filled that in. That would help us a lot. Third thing to say is like everybody we've been through the ringer this year and all the artists in the festival have pulled together like never before I mean it's bonded us like never before we spent week after week after week going how can we do this can we do this how do we do it with social distancing every show has changed and become completely different to what it set out to be because as you'll see in a bit um the, you can have many fewer people than you might have wanted to in such a small space. I think this company have had a really ingenious solution to the sweatier, more physically contacty bits of wrestling that you couldn't really do with three metre social distancing that you'll find out a little bit more about after the movie. Um, but also they've just been really inventive in pursuing what they want to do and pulling out what really matters and showing us just something and setting off on the pathway of developing what is to become a much longer show. Anyway, let's, before we start the movie, invite in Charles Ogilvie, who wrote the words, who will be able to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, Charles, are you there? Thank you, welcome to the Thank you so much, Bill, and the Tete Tete Festival for hosting us and working with us. It's been a really phenomenal experience. Um, I need to also thank the Bollyasco Foundation who supported the development of this work, and Ravensbourne College who have done phenomenal work on the video game digital elements, which we'll come on to in a second. Um, I thought it would be useful to give you a little bit of background to the showcase you're going to see to put some of the scenes into context and to tell you a little bit more about the origins of the concept of the show. Um, in 2007, at WrestleMania, a uh, stadium event with 30,000 screaming fans broadcast through live cable TV, um, one Donald Trump, property developer and wannabe American socialite, uh, part participated in a storyline where he made a bet with Vince McMahon, the granddaddy godfather of American wrestling, and uh, won. And uh, the prize for winning the bet was that he got to shave uh, Vince McMahon's hair in the ring. Um, now, the, the footage from this event is fascinating. And you see this moment where Donald Trump is looking around the, looking around the stadium initially, I think, rather perplexed at why these 30,000 Americans are following every twist and turn of this entirely farcical storyline. Um, and as he starts to shave Vince McMahon's hair, and realizes that he's the center of attention uh, and that this story however unreal has captured the emotions uh, uh, of this of this crowd you see perhaps a, a penny drop in the man's mind um, that may have played its part in leading us to where we are today um, we use this moment uh, as the kind of catalyst for the development of, of the story um, based out of a concept that mark johnson who is also our fantastic musical director for this um, performance and pianist uh, developed um, about five years ago, which was 
a discussion about the crossover between opera and wrestling and the potential for a wrestling opera, uh, noting, and if you start thinking about it, the crossovers are, are staggering. The, the, the larger than life characters, the often larger than average performers, the, uh, the comedy, the weirdness, the norms of storytelling absorbed within stylized movement, and, uh, the use of, of music, um, of special effects, and the moments of weirdness that often define one's experience of, uh, of, of those productions. Um, the opera Bread and Circuses um, tells a backstory to this imagined head shaving bet moment um, of a small independent wrestling company who make a Faustian pact in true operatic style with the property developer in question for our purposes, anonymized and not infringing any uh, commercial wrestling franchises. Um, putting this on as a showcase has been really challenging because obviously COVID means that there's a lot of restrictions. Um, and as uh, Bill has alluded to, the, um, the staging restrictions meant that wrestling was um, pretty much off the cards. Um, indeed, interactions between the characters on stage meant much of the storytelling um, was very hard to reproduce. And it's an opera with a, a, an awful lot of ensemble in it when most characters are in and around the ring as wrestling going on. Um, so um, we've selected three excerpts, which uh, Julia Mincer, the stage director, has put together into a continuous showcase, although there is no narrative that connects each scene explicitly. And I'll just quickly give you um, a precy of the scenes, because I think it will help uh, enjoy what is to come. Um, the, the first scene is the, actually the opening of Act Two. The baritone John Packard sings um, uh, Vince Flynn, who is uh, one of the kind of patriarchs of the wrestling company. It's been 15 years since Act One. He's, he's tired. He's looking forward to retiring, transcending the ring, becoming a, an attitude, a, a personality rather than a wrestler, um, manning the um, MC mic perhaps from the booth rather than um, having his body continually pounded. And he reflects on his, um, on his uh, desire to transcend this continual punishment in duet with the MC who recalls his, um, his finest hours as a wrestling champion. Um, the second of the excerpts is um, the uh, matriarch character, um, Mama Ada Vance, played by the, the wonderful uh, Grindy Gillis. Um, this scene is actually excerpt actually from the end of Act One, where in the kind of finale of Act One, where a, a bet is being made on the stage, um, she uh, explains to the audience and the assembled company her values, her backstory, and the, the patter song unpacks her inherited rules of the road, uh, salt of the earth wisdom, um, which um, is sufficiently ambiguous uh, to cause some confusion later in the opera. Um, and finally, we have a short musical interlude where you'll see a bit more video game, which I'll come on to in just one second. Uh, finally, um, we have the phenomenal Camilla Kerslake singing Shawnee, who is the sort of linchpin character. Um, she is the uh, niece of Vince Flynn. I'm not expecting everyone to remember all of this, by the way. Um, she's the niece of Vince Flynn, uh, and she witnesses Vince's murder at the end of Act Two, um, and perhaps uh, mulling over some of that wisdom that, uh, that Mama has been imparting. She has to decide whether this was real, whether it was theatre, whether it was make-believe, whether it was part of the wrestling story, whether it was murder. And if it was murder, is she required to revenge that murder? Um, and is that a real revenge? Is that a fake, a kayfabe revenge, which is the wrestling word word for the made-up storyline? So was it kayfabe? And does it require a real revenge or a kayfabe revenge? Um, the final thing I'd like to say is, um, and we're, we're lucky enough to have uh, Dev here from uh, Ravensbourne, who will talk more about the video game. But one of the tools we decided to use to make the showcase more interesting was uh, a video game, which is used as a plot device in the opera, particularly in the um, second acts, to uh, move bits of storyline forward. It, it is essentially a video game of the wrestling franchise that we are watching. Um, and uh, it's been lovingly built in an incredibly quick time for this festival by Dev and his extremely talented team, uh, echoing the retro video games of the early 90s in which uh, the, um, uh, the first act is set. So I, I shall say no more. 
Um, enjoy the show, and I look forward to the Q and A afterwards. So yeah, here we go with bread and circuses.
are you good for? Thank you. 
Each man has his own code, so. Thank you.
it's so nice to hear the sound of a live audience at the end of that and it's so tantalising not to be able to see the whole of the rest of it and um, everybody in it though I do think that that game is a really fun way of um, transferring some of the action before we move to a Q&A um, we'll talk to or well, Dev Biology will tell you who made the games all about his work with them so Dev are you there why don't we get everybody back in actually so Liam Julia and Charles why don't you all join and then we'll hand the screen over to Dev There we go. There we go. Oh. So, Dev, tell us about the game. Um, yeah. So, um, hello, everyone. I'm I'm Dev, and um, I'm here on behalf of Ramesbourne University, London. And um, yeah, it was a, it was a really kind of interesting uh, kind of series of events, really. Um, so, we've worked with Julia and Charlie. Uh, previously with an animation project with our students and uh, they approached us again with uh, another idea for this opera and uh, originally it was going to just be an animated sequence uh, again just a, a short animation in in this kind of um, retro style and um, the more um, they were talking about it the more it seems hang on this should actually be a game and we have the uh we have the up and coming games course at our university now it's the it was the second year running at the time and we just thought it was a great opportunity to collaborate again but um using a, a different medium and a different way of working really and trying to bring this to life in just a, a different way yeah and have you got some bits to show us dev were you going to share yes. your screen? <clears throat> yes, I do. So let me go ahead and do that. So um, hopefully everyone can see this OK. And so. Um, yeah, looks great here. Cool. So, um, yeah, at, at university, I'm a I'm a CEDA lecturer as part of our games development course, and um, it uh, I was it wasn't just me who was working on this. I was part of uh, a team from Ravensbourne, so um, I was heading the the project and also developing the art for it. Uh, but then we also had um, a third year student um, working on all the functionality, um, tech design, as we call it. So all the mechanics, all the movement, all the gameplay, and actually making the game just work as a whole. Um, and then we had uh, Nick Rodriguez, who is the course leader, who was acting as a consultant in the background and also developed all the menu systems and things like that for it as well. Um, so um, typically when it comes to creating uh, a game, um, we tend to just look at existing products, existing games of that era, um, all the things which uh, Charlie, um, Julie and Sebastian were describing to us, um, we thought would um, just kind of throw up ideas and look at many different consoles, many different types of gameplay and interactions to see if any of these kind of thick with, with the story and the narrative and any of the kind of beats which were happening throughout the opera. Um, so this kind of led to many discussions uh, between us all uh, about how we could kind of develop this thing so it's not um, a, a kind of tacked on project it was kind of something which had to integrate uh, together uh, with the opera so um, after this um, what we always do is just go back to the original source so Again, with many discussions uh, with Julia, Charlie, and Sebastian, uh, we'll talk about the type of wrestling company it was. And it's very important for us as game developers to just not kind of copy existing games, to actually go back uh, to find out what makes these things kind of real and makes these things fun and interactive and interesting. So we're not just making something which is generic, something which has been made before and uh, derivative so uh, we can find out exactly 
um, what it is about it, which kind of stands out to hopefully make something which is kind of truly unique. Um, so then uh, we go into the prototyping phase. So this is um, how the game started out in its very early uh, conception. So uh, we picked apart and investigated the, um, the different interactions, the different elements of play which you could have with a game. And referring it back to the, uh, the libretto as well to kind of see um, how we could really kind of mix these two worlds together in in a way which is both um, uh, fun and interactive and also kind of uh, following along the lines of the story beats as well. These are all things which are very important to us when we're developing games. Um, so um, based on this, um, there is a lot of overlap between kind of the next steps, but um, for the kind of clarity of uh, what I'm showing you, it's going to almost be a, a linear structure to this, or even though it was very not so. Um, so now we kind of get to the eye candy kind of stuff. So, um, so this is a kind of look behind the scenes of how all the characters were developed. So there's a there's a lot of stuff here, uh, a lot of iteration, a lot of trial and error towards the different characters, and um, some of them are um, were not used in the end. And um, but um, whenever it comes to designing. Um, uh, a lot of it is about um, just trying out loads of different options and just seeing what works and what doesn't. And uh, from this, we had, um, we we're coming up with ideas at the same time as well. Maybe in the actual game, we could um, have some options of changing colors and um, very kind of um, Street Fighter esque when two players pick the same character, one of them would differentiate color and, and things like that. So, um, at the same time, we were also testing out and uh, moving on from the prototype animations to just seeing how it all kind of works together. So um, as you can see, these aren't the actual characters which were in the final performance, but um, when it comes to animation, we need to just try out things uh, with, um, with prototype characters, with placeholders, just to see if uh, the posing is right, if it kind of feels correct when we're playing the game, when we're inputting in buttons, where we're pressing on our keyboards or controllers, that it feels okay. It feels like you are performing those actions as as you're doing it. And so th this is where uh, a lot of the different aspects of the game kind of tie together. So as we were supplying the artwork, um, then Philip was taking all this and stitching it all together in a way which it kind of worked and feels like you were actually playing it rather than just pressing a button and then watching a sequence of events happen. So um, uh, a big aspect of this was developing the game which um, which had a retro feel to it but also had uh, a modern twist to it as well. So. We use a combination of 2D and 3D elements in this game. And we worked uh, really hard between all of us, just uh, trying to get the style to um, to almost fit seamlessly. So um, having, the, um, having the integration and the blending of 3D elements and 2D elements uh, with that pixelated um, style was uh, was quite a technical challenge which uh, which we developed um, from the very beginning of this project uh, we were doing many tests and just getting that kind of look right really so um, so that is that is really kind of the game development in a nutshell so um, as you saw today this is as the game is right now so um, all those sequences uh, which which you saw during the opera, um, those those were actually uh, live footage from the game, which uh, which we just played the game and we recorded it. Um, none of those sequences were um, kind of set up or kind of orchestrated. Really, it was just that is the game, you know, 
and we're we're really proud of what we were able to achieve and it was a great kind of experience collaborating with um with the rest of the opera team on on getting this vision kind of created really so um yeah so that that is us really so we also had some outside kind of support and help on this so jess firma was um, was in charge of the character designs and also the UI. So all the interfaces, all the health bars and the, um, the portraits and things like that. And then uh, Sam Galloway, um, another external artist, um, helped us with all the, with all the crowd members uh, behind the ring. And um, here is our contact details. If anyone wants to um, um, follow us on Twitter or Instagram, then there you go. So thank you, everyone. Well, it's amazing to have, thank you very much. It's amazing to um, see how much went into that and that being just one element of the opera. It's um, good for our audiences, I think, to see quite how much work goes into what happens. Now, a reminder to our audience, to, uh, do type questions into the chat for our panel. We have with us Liam Wade, who's the composer, Dev Biagi still with us, who made the game, Julia Mincer, who is the director, and I think initiator of the project, and um, Charlie Ogilvy, who wrote the words. Now, Julia, um, how, where did it all come from? So, I can't take total credit for initiating it. It came out of a conversation I had with Mark Johnston, our music director. I was directing a really bizarre piece in the Helsinki Festival, and he was there um, as part of a, a Deutsche Bank stipendium as an observer in the workshop. And we just ended up chatting, and he ended up telling me about this conversation he was having with a friend of his about the intersection between opera and wrestling that Charlie spoke about at the beginning. And I thought a lot of the commonalities that Mark was bringing up about um, kayfabe and emotional fidelity being prioritized over fact had a lot of overlap with what we've seen happen recently in US and now ever more so in UK political culture. So as Mark kept saying, what a great opera we could make about wrestling, I just thought I can make this happen. I've got all the people, why don't we just get everyone together and, and do it? So we did, we um, applied for a bunch of fellowships and ended up with the Bolyasco Fellowship and this thing was created. Oh, I just can't wait to see the full thing. Now, another completely different element in the opera, obviously, is the music. Um, which has come from you, Liam. So tell us a little bit about where that all came from and what really triggered you with it. Thanks a lot, Bill. I just want to <laughs> say that if you're looking for emotional fidelity, you don't need to look any further because I'm the composer. I know more about emotional fidelity than any other composer, any other academic composer, uh, 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 you know, tender footing around, acting like they know it all. You got emotional fidelity right here. And I'll tell you something else. We heard a lot about st stipendiums and fellowships, but we also got, we got muscle. We, we got, we got sweat in this opera. Now we've been, and, and I want to say great work, Dev, on the video game. And the putting together, the 2D and the 3D. And that's a lot like what I'm doing. We're bringing back 1991, baby. I got analog cassette recording and I got, I got digital recording from the modern age. And I got the ultimate analog. I got opera singers and we're putting it together and we're doing our own thing. Cause this isn't just about going back and and doing, doing something retro, this is retro futurism. This is the future of opera. The greatest thing about opera and the greatest thing about America and Great Britain and Germany, where I'm talking to you now, see opera every few years, it reinvents itself. And that's what bread and circuses, the wrestling opera is gonna do here. And we, we're using it all. There's, there's no taboo. 
No holds barred, no disqualifications. I'm Liam Wade. I know more about emotional f- fidelity than probably any wrestling composer out there. And Amazing. That's, what, that's what I want to say, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Well, questions pouring into the chat now. Um, first, from Anna Gregg, did integrating the composition and the game differ from how straight games slash theme tunes are integrated in gaming? Wow. Not sure I totally understand that. Do, do well, you guys? I, I, I can take that question. Go for it, Liam. So this opera starts out uh, very much in the opera world. Big influence on me for this opera was was Wagner and Das Rheingold and the way we're laying out uh, uh, the different light motifs and the different musical themes that tell the story. So in the first act, it takes place in 1991. This is real time. And this is very much a traditional opera. Now in the second act, we see behind the scenes and we see, we go into the future, we go into 2007 and we see the wrestlers years later playing a video game of themselves. So when they're playing the video game, um, the music that's part of the video games that that is composed and uh, in that sense, you got the introduction music, you got the scene selection, you got the wrestling music, that's happening on the screen. And at the same time, the the wrestlers are interacting with each other. So that way the music comes out of the video game and directly, uh, almost like an underscoring or uh, you know, a layer of music. So, um, so I wanted it to be very natural and I wanted it to, to be that, like they're actually playing a video game and singing, singing to each other. So that was my idea. And then maybe Dev and Charlie and Julia have something to say about the way the video game music is integrated into this composition. Um, yeah, so, so something which was very interesting for us was that um, typically when we're working on on games, um, they're not as uh, they're not as uh, composed as they would be for uh, for a sequence of events um, such as an opera. Um, we would tend to have uh, a series of triggers which would uh, play various different music at various different times so um, a lot of the times you have to be quite general with the music it can't be too specific about uh, things which are taking place at the very moment in time so uh, so for me this is this was a very different experience um, uh, especially with a game like this um, when you get uh, games which are very cinematic and they are very uh, uh, narrative driven. Then, uh, then it uh, it is um, it is created in a similar way to this. But uh, for a game like this, then um, yeah, it was it was a very different experience. And yeah, um, here's another one from Joanna Harris, which is two questions. We've got loads to get through. Congratulations, everyone! I have two questions. One: What does the title "Bread and Circuses" mean? And two, who do you think are better actors, wrestlers, or opera singers? I can do the first half. So, so um, we picked the name. It's from the kind of ancient Rome. So I, I can't remember exactly which emperor it was. Said, "How do you kind of make the people love you and retain control of Rome? You offer the people bread and circuses, and obviously, you know, we're offering our audience a circus of sorts." Um, in the in the gladiatorial combat of the wrestling ring, and we're talking about issues of storytelling and populism, which is a kind of analog of that sentiment, which uh, which arrives from uh, from from ancient Rome. But I will pass over the uh, the other half of the question to my uh, glamorous assistant, who is also an opera singer. So this is going to be a bit of a weighted answer. Can I ask you to repeat the second part of the question, the beginning of it? Uh, who do you think are better actors, wrestlers or opera singers? I don't think I can generalize so broadly at that, but it is a very similar skill set. The, um, the choreography that wrestlers learn to, to do what they do in the ring is incredibly complex and requires incredibly 
quick thinking and is really quite similar to some of the stage choreography that I have found myself doing as, as an opera singer. So I think you might find that um, you're dealing with a similar color palette and rather than saying one is, one is better than the other, I, I think you can say they can be comparable. We're hoping to yeah. overlap and have our performers be wrestlers, actors and opera singers. Well, yeah, I mean, we had this bit of amazing luck, didn't we, that I, I wasn't going to say to the audience, but we might as well, that um, uh, I said it to the audience here, that the cockpit actually does wrestling on a Sunday. And were there not COVID, we would have been doing a double bill of Bread and Circuses and the cockpit's regular wrestling, which I think would have made an amazing day and a really good chance to to make the comparison but it was fantastic you know pared down though it was to see you doing your piece in a space that is also for wrestling it was it, it was really fun um let's skip on to our last question for the time being unless another one appears uh, from Martin Watchell, and I hope I've said that right, as a lifelong wrestling fan, this was great fun. I wondered how Julia found directing wrestling action via the video game. So I wish I could take more credit for what the actions were in the video game. We, we have, were working with a very specific palette of movements that these, the sprites, which are the 2D animations that you see that, are, that eventually become the characters, that the sprites were able to carry out within the time frame we had. So we, Dev basically showed us a vocabulary of movements that we could use between the characters that we had, that we had guided him in building. And we explained a series of moves that fit into the plot that he, that he um, explained using that vocabulary. It was also a helpful principle that we had to <coughs> use very specific movements with straight lines so that we could show the commonality between what the live actors were doing and what they were doing on the screen to demonstrate that they were the same person. Yes, there's a striking resemblance now between Charlie and Crispin Varsity. I'm sure I'm not the only person that's noticed that. Um, a, a question which everybody must be wondering but haven't put in the chat is, um, will we get to be able to play the game? How will the integration or even separation um, continue as the show involves? Does it become part of the mem merchandise or part of the performance or both or, or what? Um, so the game is still, it's still um, quite a ways off from, uh, from being released. Uh, even though we got a game, we got the game to a point where we could go ahead and re and do captures directly from it in in support of and uh, integration with the opera. It's still quite a ways off of being released as as a product in its in its own rights, really. So um, I don't have any kind of um, a time frame at the moment and when it will be released. But um, yeah, I mean we're kind of hoping that. Um, this uh, this conversation doesn't really end here really and neither does bread and circuses so um the game will be released um at some points but um yeah i, I wouldn't have an exact time framing for that and uh, no, julia will it be in sorry over to you the ideal time frame would be for it to accompany the um full run of bread and circuses in july 2021 in St. Albans at a gladiator arena, a second century Roman amphitheater in which um, the Maltings Theater has been building a soundstage every year to do outdoor performances. Well, in the current circumstances, that sounds like a very good idea because, um, of course, outdoor performances have been doing a lot better than indoor, but we did an indoor performance. Um, when, Time's ticking away, really. I think we probably should be saying goodbye, but thank you for a really interesting and great chat. And thanks, Deb, for teaching us about video games. And Liam for being such a great yeah. composer. And uh, oh. Julia. Uh, my and pleasure. Charlie, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much.